Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's presentation on developing genetic engineering tools for non-conventional and non-model yeast, presented by Dr. Mark Blenner of the University of Delaware. To see Dr. Blenner's complete bio, you may click on his name in the presenter window. I am David Stegemeyer, the Senior Market Development Manager for GenScript's CRISPR Services Portfolio, and I will be your moderator for this presentation. We do encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you have during the presentation. Uh, to do so, simply type them into the field below. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for and follow up any others after the talk. Um, if you may also submit any technical issues you have there as well, if you're having any trouble hearing or seeing the presentation. So with that, we thank uh, Dr. Blenner and uh, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to just thank everyone for the opportunity to share uh, our work with you today. My name is Mark Blenner. I'm an associate professor of chemical engineering at the University of Delaware. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you a bit about what my group has done in developing genetic engineering tools for non-conventional and non-model yeast. So to start with from a high level, as a chemical engineer, I view this, the, the cell as a chemical manufacturing plant. Um, and in, inside of this plant, there's a huge number of chemical reactions occurring. And there's a, there's a fairly complex network of coupled energy and redox uh, reactions uh, along with the material network. And so if you take a look at the simple diagram of cellular metabolism, that's over on the side of my slide here, uh, every one of these lines uh, is, is an enzyme catalyzed, re catalyzed reaction. Uh, and each one of these dots or nodes is um, is a small molecule metabolite. So you can see the intricate way in which um, this network is connected. And this is just looking at sort of the very um, um, central most parts of, of metabolism. And so if we're thinking about using cells as chemical factories, uh, then we have to gain control over this network. And so uh, if, if, for example, we decide that we want to make a particular product that isn't made by a cell, this particular cell normally, what we end up needing to do is uh, adding uh, adding reactions that don't already exist there. And so you might see this new line being drawn to another node, um, indicating that we're adding in a new enzyme uh, to, to, to catalyze a new chemical reaction. Now, this is already occurring within the context of this existing cellular network. And so uh, we also have to think about ways that we need to redirect uh, the reactions or redirect the flux of, um, of these intermediates towards this new product. Um, and and at the same time, uh, we have to cope with the needs for the cell to have energy um, and, and metabolites for its own growth. And so um, this together is uh, known as metabolic engineering. Um, and so we're thinking about the ways that we can rewire the metabolism of the cell so that cells can, can meet its basic needs but can be co-opted to, to produce uh, chemicals that are of value to, um, to society. Now, the way in which we can control these reactions is basically through the use of synthetic biology. So all of these, all these lines I mentioned were enzyme catalyzed reactions. And so um, uh, that means that we have proteins that are acting as catalysts. In order to get those proteins in the cell, um, sort of work backward to the central dogma of molecular biology. And it, it turns out that the, the, the instructions for those uh, enzymes are encoded in the DNA. And so this really becomes, if we want to engineer the metabolic network, we have to use synthetic biology to change the DNA within these cells. Uh, and so that's why a lot of our work uh, largely focuses around genetic engineering tools to do genome engineering, um, to put new DNA into cells in specific locations, and to have control over that through things like promoter engineering. Um, and so in, in, um, this is kind of the starting point for, for how we think about uh, engineering cells. Uh, and, and so we're often starting new projects with the question of what kind of cell, what kind of microorganisms should we use, right? So uh, we choose microorganisms as they're just easy to handle, they're cheap to grow, uh, they, they're scalable. Um, and so uh, we're, uh, much of the research in this field has been uh, founded on using model systems like E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae because we've had the genetic tools available to engineer those kinds of organisms. 
Um, what what uh, to to our point of view, um, the the we choose uh, to focus a lot on non-model hosts um, where we have less established genetic engineering tools, but these organisms tend to have more useful complex phenotypes. And so um, things like uh, product um, tolerance, um, tolerance to, to extreme conditions are often not characteristics we find in these model hosts. And so it's a lot harder in our opinion to um, to engineer these model hosts to, um, to do some of these more complex things um, than it is to find organisms that naturally do these complex things and develop the tool sets so that we can do the genetic engineering to get them to make a particular product or to use a particular substrate. Um, and so the, our, our projects often start with um, uh, either a search through the literature um, and more recently we've been um, uh, developing, uh, accessing and developing our own um, culture collections as well as going even into the environment to look for um, novel microbes that have really interesting properties for, for, um, for bioproduction. And uh, my lab uh, is, is still originally and is still interested in oleochemicals as a product. And so this is a class of molecules um, that's largely derived from, um, from petroleum as well as unsustainable biological sources um, the applications are really wide from fuels to materials to personal care and detergents. Um, and uh, it turns out that there's a class of organisms called oleaginous yeast that have evolved this, um, this complex phenotype of being able to produce um, uh, a lot of, of lipids, which would be precursors for these oleochemicals. And so um, the, uh, the, the evolution of these oleaginous yeast has really um, created a, a, a well-optimized system that, that, that nature created um, that is well adept at making a lot of the precursors that are really important for making fatty acids, which are then the precursors for making oleochemicals. Um, and so we've focused um, most of our work in my lab uh, so far on oleaginous yeast. And um, our favorite oleaginous yeast, um, which, is, which is sort of the original one that my lab worked with, is called Euroia lipolytica. Um, Euroia lipolytica is uh, not too dissimilar from um, the better known beer brewing yeasts, um, but instead of creating a lot of alcohol, what it does is create a lot of lipids. And so um, the other reasons we were we really liked uh, Euroia lipolytica as a starting point for our, our work um, are, are listed here. Um, there are some genetic engineering tools available. It has a fairly wide range of tolerance to different salts and chemicals. It can use a lot of different substrates. Um, and, and it has a history as being uh, an industrial host. Um, and so uh, we and others in the field, a uh, little over 10 years ago now, uh, developed a whole suite of, um, of promoters and, and, and the DNA control elements um, that have been the foundation for a lot of the um, advanced metabolic engineering we've seen um, in, in the past 10 years. And so I'm gonna go through some short stories on um, um, some different uh, genetic engineering tools that my lab has developed and show you different ways in which we're using them to optimize um, uh, in increasingly more challenging yeast uh, for uh, biochemical production. Um, and so this is a project uh, that was done by one of my uh, senior graduate students, Vijay Ganesan. Uh, in this project, uh, as we were developing new promoters, we realized that there was a small promoter element called the TATA or TATA box um, that could be used to sort of tune the level of a promoter, so how strongly um, you got expression from a particular gene without really um, uh, interfering with the rest of the other properties of those promoters. Um, and so given the small size of this, this genetic element, uh, we thought that we would create um, our, our uh, use the TATA box as a way to fine tune expression levels um, for heterologous genes. Um, and so what he's done is uh, created, uh, basically randomized those eight base pairs that make up the TATA box. Um, and then we use that to drive the expression of a green fluorescent protein. And then we can use something called back sorting to allow us to identify um, uh, random sequences, random eight base pair sequences, which gave in the context of a promoter, which gave rise to either high, medium or low levels of expression of this green fluorescent protein. And then we can sort those, those populations out and sequence uh, the DNA to see what TATA boxes led to which, you know, either high, medium, or low um, levels of expression. We're just showing some of the results here on the bottom. Um, and, and interestingly, we find um, lots of TATA box sequences which are less optimized than 
um, the, the already strong one that was present in this promoter originally, but we found a few other ones that are more um, that, that are actually more strong. Um, and so we can use this information to, uh, to, to optimize uh, heterologous pathways, so pathways that are non-native to our, our yeast system. Uh, and so we're showing an example of that here. Uh, we wanted to convert uh, tryptophan into something called deoxyviolacin. Um, this has a particularly, uh, it's a colorful product, so it's easy to identify. Um, the, these uh, series of reactions are catalyzed by four different enzymes, and there's a competing non-enzymatic reaction that occurs with one of the intermediates. Um, and so this is not too uncommon to find uh, this sort of nonlinearity in, in reaction networks. Um, and so what we did was, uh, it's not clear what is the optimal expression level for each of these four enzymes um, to, to produce the most deoxyviolacin. Uh, in, in, intuitively, we might think that we want to make every one of these genes express very strongly, but um, if the intrinsic activity of, of these enzymes in our yeast is uh, different than expected, then, um, then that relationship may not be true. And so it, it, uh, we were able to make a 625 pathway library um, so we took all four of these genes and placed in front of it the same promoter with one of five variants of the TATA box sequence that went from strong to weak expression levels. And so we've called the strongest one five, the weakest one one. And we made every combination um, of promoter strength driving each of these four genes. Um, and we were able to transform this library into our yeast and, and test for the sort of the most brightly colored um, clones that we got at the end of a growth period. Um, and so uh, we're just showing, again, some of those results in the bottom here. And, and um, what, what should be obvious from, from our results is that there's no real, um, uh, there, there are certain steps which are sort of insensitive to the expression levels and some other steps which, um, uh, some other enzymes which are uh, very strongly sensitive to expression levels. And that the, the, the optimal answer here is not to just have the highest expression level for each enzyme. And so we can balance these pathways um, and produce uh, and optimize them in rapid fashion. Another tool that we worked on with collaborators um, from UC Riverside uh, many years ago now in 2016 uh, was the development of the first CRISPR-Cas9 system for Euroia lipolytica. Um, and here, uh, the key insight uh, that we had was that it turns out that the expression of the guide RNA, so this is the, the piece of RNA that, that uh, dictates where the, the Cas9 enzyme will cleave DNA, uh, was sort of the limiting factor for us. Um, and so Corey Schwartz from Ian Wilden's lab came up with this hybrid promoter system um, to drive higher expression levels of the guide RNA. Um, we're just showing the results for, um, for uh, a certain um, combination of uh, a certain promoter design we're able to achieve um, for, for this particular gene uh, nearly 100% efficiency in, in its deletion. Um, we use tools uh, like that. Uh, we use that tool and similar uh, developed tools that, to, uh, to do metabolic engineering in Euroia lipolytica and to help speed that along. Um, and so one of these projects uh, is, is work that is, uh, has been done by a recent postdoc from my lab, um, Siva Samasudran, and uh, he worked on making fatty alcohols uh, in Euroia lipolytica through compartmentalization and co-localization strategy. And so here, what we've done is localize the enzymes to make this product fatty alcohol to the peroxisome. So this is a specific um, organelle within the cell. Uh, we chose that organelle because it's where a lot of toxic reactions go and the intermediates for fatty alcohol production can be toxic to cells. It's also a place where in, in Euroia lipolytica, we expect there to be a lot of fatty acyl CoA, which is the substrate for um, the fatty alcohol uh, reductase, which is the fatty alcohol forming enzyme. Um, so uh, Siva figured out that um, uh, in addition to uh, using um, a, a proper tag to effectively localize this enzyme to the peroxisome, that by actually fusing it to um, this 3-cat enzyme, which is a protein which makes a precursor for, um, for, basic, for basically providing fatty acyl-CoA, um, by fusing the uh, reductase enzyme to this 3-cat enzyme, um, that we were able to, uh, to get uh, very high levels of fatty alcohol produced. And it turns out that's actually the fusion, putting those two enzymes in close proximity together, not just using its mechanism for uh, importing into the proxisome, which is most um, important uh, for the high activity that we're observing. Uh, he also then uh, addressed the issue of providing sufficient cofactor 
um, to drive the alcohol forming reaction in the peroxisome. And so um, NADH is plentifully available uh, in, in, in active peroxisomes that are undergoing uh, beta oxidation. Um, but NADPH, which is the cofactor needed for the alcohol forming reaction, um, is not as available. And so uh, we've tried a couple of different strategies, including the expression of this POS5 enzyme, which is an NADH kinase um, in the peroxisome. And um, by doing so, we're actually able to convert uh, NADH into NADPH. Uh, and that helps uh, further increase um, uh, the, the fatty alcohol production that we're seeing. Um, we've tried some other strategies to improve the, the titers, but they, they're, they're fairly um, insensitive to those, those um, efforts at this point. And so we're, about, we're able to achieve about 1.6 grams per liter uh, in batch, which is the highest observed um, uh, fatty alcohol titer in, uh, in a batch system to date. Um, and then by doing a little bit of process optimization in a bioreactor, um, we're able to almost double that, uh, that titer. Now, the, the thing that makes your rolypolitica good at producing uh, oleochemicals like fatty alcohols uh, are, is its ability to produce the precursors in high, in high flux. Um, it turns out that those same precursors like acetyl-CoA and NADPH are also needed for lots of other products, including um, pharmaceutical intermediates or plant natural products. And so uh, Ayushi, who is a, a senior graduate student in my lab, has been working on um, engineering Euroila politica as a host, not only for oleochemicals, but also now for natural products. Um, and so she worked on making a compound, a compound called Draniol, which is an important intermediate in making more complex natural products. It's also an interesting product on its own. Um, it has a sort of a rosy scent to it. Um, and uh, by, by employing strategies that have already been shown to be effective in other yeasts, um, by employing basically the same strategy, she's been able to show much higher titers of geraniol um, than have been reported in, in, in other yeast studies. Uh, and this is um, due to uh, the optimized metabolism of ureal politica for producing these, these precursor compounds. So um, uh, going back a few steps here, we uh, were able to build on the CRISPR-Cas9 tool, not only for metabolic engineering, but also for doing functional genomics. And so providing uh, a, a deeper understanding of the function of all of the genes in um, the genome of your oil politica. Uh, and so this experiment uh, was led again by our collaborators at UC Riverside uh, and, and a graduate student then uh, named Corey Schwartz. Uh, and so what he did was they, they took um, uh, the Euroila politica, and uh, as a control, it was sort of the, the wild type uh, Euroila politica, and the integrated uh, Cas9 gene, um, and uh, um, also integrated Cas9 and in a KU70 knockout. So this KU70 knockout is unable to do a certain form of DNA repair called non-homologous end joining. And if you uh, then transform into these cells plasmids that are uh, contain the guide RNAs for targeting um, either an essential gene like ACC1 or non-essential gene like this D17 pseudogene um, or non-targeting control, um, you get different behaviors out. And so um, for uh, the, the Cas9 containing uh, Euroila politica, if you uh, have a guide RNA for an essential gene, um, then if it's functioning, it will uh, create an indel, a mutation in that gene. And because it's essential, if that mutation uh, eliminates its function by in, for introducing uh, frame shifts and premature stop codons, um, then as you grow these cells, you won't, uh, these cells can't grow, right? They, they're, they're lacking this essential gene for growth. Um, whereas uh, for a non-essential gene, it should have very little impact on the growth. And so that's what we see in, in sort of this test study here. The, non the non-targeting template has no, has no significant effect. Um, uh, the, the essential gene is eliminated in the Cas9 strain and the non-essential gene is still present. Uh, what we see in this Cas9 KU70 knockout is we're basically assessing the ability for these guide RNAs to functionally cut um, and uh, cut at all the gene of interest. And so um, because the, the cell no longer has its dominant mechanism for repairing these double-stranded DNA breaks, any guide RNA that leads to a functional cut of the DNA will basically be a lethal um, phenotype. And so you eliminate those, um, those cutting guide RNAs uh, from the library.
So um, we, we took this concept, built it out to genome scale. And so this we made six guide RNAs for every single gene for over all, all um, slightly over 8,000 genes in the Eurolipolytical genome. Um, and so made about 50,000 or so guide RNAs um, and transformed them into each of these three yeast strains. We're able to then take that library or that pool of cells. We grow them in cultures and pastures them every two days. And so we're giving cells a chance to grow. And so cells that have lost the ability to grow because we've knocked out a um, an essential gene in the Cas9 strain or in the Cas9 KU70 knockout strain because we have functional guide RNAs that are cutting the genome, um, th those end up being uh, sort of de-enriched or lost um, as we grow cells farther out. Um, and so that's what we're showing on this slide is um, going from day two to day four, uh, we start to see enrichment for, um, for, for cells that contain either uh, guide RNAs that did not functionally cut the genome or that uh, cut the genome but and caused the mutation in a non-essential gene which did not affect its growth. If you affect the growth, so um, these negative cutting scores um, and negative uh, fitness scores um, indicate sort of more effective cutting or more um, or more a more essential gene. Um, and so things will that are more essential and cut well will start to shift down to the bottom left quadrant. Uh, and, and, and so we can basically tally up um, uh, by, by high throughput DNA sequencing, we can tally up the number of these guide RNAs we see after we do some growth. Um, and again, the ones that are um, uh, most, uh, for, for genes that are most essential, we see the sort of the lowest fitness scores. Genes that cut, uh, for guide RNAs that cut those genes really effectively, we see um, low cutting scores. Um, and so what this allows us to do now is to actually take um, our, our libraries uh, and, and sort of filter the data uh, post hoc. Uh, and so what we're showing are uh, sort of a selected set of known essential and non-essential genes and their fitness scores. And so if you didn't do any filtering based on, on, on the ability of the guide RNAs to effectively cut those genes, we would have, um, uh, we, we would identify a number of known uh, essential genes as looking like they're non-essential. Whereas if we filter the data um, shown on the bottom, uh, we're able to get a better separation of essential and non-essential genes. Um, and so this kind of um, higher quality data allows us to more easily identify um, essential genes from these genome scale screens when we compare them to other um, uh, genome scale screens like transposon mutagenesis libraries. Uh, and it's particularly useful for sort of the smaller end um, uh, uh, genes that are, I think are just statistically harder to, to access via the transposon screens. Um, comparing uh, known essential genes uh, to, uh, to, to known essential genes um, from uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, we find a, a large number of genes that are uniquely essential to Euroia lipolytica. However, almost half of those genes are, uh, the functions of those genes are unknown. And so what this is telling us is there's, there's still a lot of this, what I call genomic dark matter out there um, that we need to further investigate to understand the, the full capacity of this cell line and really all, all cells that we work, work with. We developed um, another uh, genome ed editing tool called a base editor. Or, sorry, we applied a base editing tool um, to your lipolytica. Um, and so here, rather than introducing double-stranded DNA breaks, what we're able to do is um, is to uh, uh, chemically modify uh, bases without the double strand break, and um, in doing so, uh, we can more effectively do what's called multiplexing, where we actually edit multiple targets at once. Um, and so we're showing here in the bottom uh, uh, um, sort of the end result of a lot of um, optimization work by uh, by VJ, um, where he's able to actually uh, edit with over forty percent efficiency. Um, five targets at once. Um, this is uh, nearly impossible to do in, in our system uh, using CRISPR-Cas9. Num that number of double strand breaks is, is going to be toxic to, to cells. Um, he then applied this tool to do a, a large combination of different types of knockouts um, to improve the production of a natural product called naringenin. And so in doing so, we were able to just do um, demonstrate for the first time certain knockouts uh, would have a beneficial effect on increasing the titer of neuroengine and we're able to double the titer just through, um, uh, through, through these knockouts. Um, my, my lab has also started working with other types of oleaginous yeast 
um, and non-model systems um, such as cutaneo trichospore and oleaginosis. And so we got interested in using lignin um, as a substrate for driving bioprocesses. Uh, and, and so we went through a, a long screening process in this paper cited here, identified this particularly interesting yeast and characterize its ability to use the aromatic compounds that come from lignin depolymerization. And the reason I mention this is I wanted to bring up one last topic, um, which is our recent work in plastic waste valorization. And so here we sort of saw an analogy between the lignin valorization work we were doing and the similar thought process around the need to deconstruct plastic waste. And you have a variety of compounds um, that a biological system is probably very well suited for funneling into a small number of key intermediates and then rebuilding into more valuable things. And so in a project with uh, collaborators at Iowa State um, uh, who worked on, on, on thermal uh, depolymerization of pl mixed plastic waste, we were able to get this, um, uh, this, this sort of waxy substance in the middle of my, my slide here, um, this nasty mixture of different hydrocarbons, various oxidation states, um, and we we're able to uh, find a way to biologically upgrade it. Um, there's a paper referenced on the side of the slide here uh, for screening a number of different um, oleaginous yeasts um, and other yeasts that are known to, uh, uh, um, that are already used in biotechnology. Um, and we identified candida maltosa as, um, as being um, the most uh, uh, useful for this application. Here, we're just showing that we can evolve it to grow faster on this, this particularly nasty substrate um, and that we can use a variety of different lower value medias to drive um, its, its, its growth. The last thing I wanna point out is we were able to um, uh, develop a series of genetic tools um, to enable us to do uh, a, a genetic engineering in this, um, this new non-model yeast. Um, we're showing here a couple of different examples uh, we were able to take a bunch of different DNA fragments, assemble them together to make a beta carotene production pathway, um, and then directly integrate that into the genome um, of this yeast. Uh, and you can see some of the results um, there. We can just see the, the more orange color of the beta carotene in, in, um, uh, in, in the cells on the right-hand side. We were also um, able to identify some new targets for improving the, the growth rate um, of this yeast on this particular substrate. Uh, which is shown on the bottom left. Um, and we're able to use the same, uh, the, the promoters we've developed and the transformation methods, uh, the genome engineering tools to, uh, um, uh, to overexpress that particular transcription factor. So um, the conclusions are um, that I think it's really important for us as a community to lean into biodiversity and take advantage of natural biodesign principles um, that uh, the accelerated tool development um, uh, that we've seen in the last decade has really intensified the engineering of Euroia lipolitica and that as we start to uh, dive into more interesting organisms uh, that we can uh, take take a lot of uh, lessons learned from uh, Euroia lipolitica and similar systems that may help us accelerate um, the onboarding of new uh, microorganisms for bioproduction. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and acknowledge many of the students in my lab who have done a great deal of the work um, that you have seen today. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you all have. Thanks. All right, thank you, Dr. Blenner, for that excellent presentation. Um, we can now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. I see we have some great questions already coming in. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, please do so now and we'll answer as many as we have time for. So let's get started. Um, our first question today for Dr. Blenner is, um, how can the advances in genomics and synthetic biology, particularly in the context of microbial engineering for value added product production, be applied to the fields of cancer biology and immunology? to enhance our understanding of cancer cells, immune responses, and potentially develop innovative therapeutic approaches. Great, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Uh, thanks, thanks for the, the question. Um, it's an interesting one and uh, not an expert in cancer, so I'll, I'll qualify my answer with that. Um, but I, you know, I think uh, the way we look at a cell uh, for, for biochemical production, um, is is to view it as a, a you know from from the perspective of its metabolism and um, uh, cancer in particular uh, has um, 
you know, may have some genetic origins, but really has a lot of manifestations from my understanding uh, in its metabolism. And so I think understanding um, uh, the ways in which uh, the cell's metabolisms are, are altered um, in, in diseases like cancer um, may provide some alternative routes either um, through things like gene editing or, or, or drug or more standard drugs to um, intervene with uh, the way the cell has rewired its metabolism for optimal growth. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and let's see, um, what metabolic engineering applications are better suited for base editors rather than a CRISPR-Cas9 system? Yeah, um, thanks again for another really interesting question. So uh, the the base editors are, um, so, so there's a lot of, um, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, is, is fairly versatile. Um, the, the base editors allow us to work uh, without the need for creating um, double-stranded DNA breaks. And so there's a few applications where the base editors probably have a, an advantage. One is when we want to make a lot of simultaneous or multiplexed um, um, edits. And so if we have the need to, for example, knock out um, um, you know, four or five or, or more genes simultaneously, um, then uh, the base editors are going to have an advantage um, simply for the fact that the each double strand break we make is um, the double strand breaks are toxic to cells and repairing those um, you know if you have more breaks it's going to be harder to repair all of them on any given cycle so um, so that's one one application um, where I think it has advantages the other is likely in scenarios where um, uh, repairing double strand breaks uh, often we uh, need dividing cells. And so if you're working in cells where um, that they're not dividing or not dividing quickly, um, the base editors might be a faster and easier way of um, uh, of doing the, the genetic engineering in those systems. Great. Thank you. Um, do you see there's other opportunities for cellular engineering of ole oleaginous yeast? Yeah. I mean, so uh, the oleaginous yeasts, right, are, I think, are a great platform for producing uh, oleochemicals, right, so these molecules derived from um, from fatty acids. Uh, but we really haven't, I think, um, explored a wide range of that space yet as a community. Um, so there are additional oleochemicals, I think, that um, we, we will start to consider um, as we get better and better at engineering these organisms, um, uh, thinking about potential materials applications that might come from oleochemical um, intermediates, uh, like uh, there's, a, there's a class of um, poly, biological polyesters, um, which are uh, derivatives of um, fatty acid uh, intermediates. Um, and so, so I think there's still, there's still a lot of space um, to work in for, uh, for the oleochemicals themselves. Uh, you've seen in the presentation, um, some of our recent work in trying to expand into um, uh, uh, natural products and, and for the reasons of like they're sharing, they share a lot of the same uh, metabolic precursors uh, as, as oleochemicals, um, seeing a growing number of um, companies and labs working on other hydrophobic products that are, um, you know, related to oleochemicals. And, and so there's advantages in using oleaginous yeast in that they're able to um, uh, remove um, these potentially toxic compounds from the cytoplasm through sort of a sort of like an, an, an extraction process, essentially. So you have these these fat droplets that are able to um, kind of uh, extract and absorb up these hydrophobic molecules that are made inside of cells. Um, and so I, I think there's there's probably a, a far more opportunities that haven't been explored yet in in both of those areas in hydrophobic compounds, um, as well as in um, uh, in in natural products. Um, and and I think the the oleaginous yeast uh, generally have fairly good protein secretion um, uh, mechanisms. And so uh, we will, uh, I'm expecting to see more progress in that space uh, producing uh, secreted enzymes and proteins in the near future. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, I see we actually have a lot of questions coming in and I think we're up against the time limit here. So we will do our best to get those answered uh, remotely after the talk. Um, so. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for your wonderful questions. And a big thank you to Dr. Blenner for his talk. We 
do have a little bit of a break scheduled, I think, between um, now and the next talk. So definitely want to encourage everyone to um, check out the 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 booths and um, you know reach out with any questions to your booth representative there. And um, we're happy to have you. And thanks again. Until next time. Bye.